Here's some news from the world over. Recent media reports suggest that a trial of Archbishop Theodore McCarrick is underway, and Vatican sources have told the Catholic News Agency that his case is not being handled by a full judicial process. Sources at the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith have confirmed that allegations against McCarrick are being considered through an abbreviated approach called an administrative penal process. This indicates that the Catholic Church is moving quickly towards sentencing the cleric. The former prominent Archbishop of Washington, who now stands accused of sexually abusing three minors and harassing adult priests and seminarians, already has become the first U.S. Cardinal ever removed from office due to sexual misconduct allegations. Now he faces the prospect of being laicized. And the Vatican has confirmed that Argentinian Bishop Gustavo Zanchetta, who resigned suddenly in July of 2017 for health reasons and whose resignation was accepted by Pope Francis, is now under investigation. Three priests in his diocese of Oran claim that he sexually abused a dozen seminarians. They filed a report with the Apostolic Nuncio. Francis elevated Zanchetta to bishop in 2013 of his own initiative, bypassing all canonical procedure. After accepting his resignation, the Pope created a position for him as assessor of the Holy See's financial administration. According to the Vatican, the allegations against Zanchetta only emerged in recent months. Here with their analysis is the editor-in-chief of the CatholicThing.org, Robert Royal, and member of the Papal Posse and D.C. Bureau Chief of the Catholic News Agency, Ed Condon. Thank you both for, for joining me, gentlemen. Bob, Pleasure. I'll just give you a salute. You're too far away to reach. Um, I want to start with the canon law story we reported earlier, that McCarrick is being subjected to what's being called an administrative penal appeal. Now, Ed, you've dealt with these cases. What does that mean in actuality? So an administrative penal process is something that exists in canon law and is used very frequently. Okay. What happens is if there's a, if there's a criminal case or what looks to be a criminal case, a credible allegation, you do a preliminary investigation and it turns up so much evidence that it looks like a full-blown trial is unnecessary and would just spin the process out, then you can move to an administrative penal process. Now, mm -hmm. this is a really stripped-down version of a trial. It's not even a trial, properly speaking. But there are assessors involved to help the judge make a determination. Mm -hmm. There's still the right of defense. So in this case, Archbishop McCarrick himself will be able to look at the evidence against him, as well as canon lawyer, and make arguments. Mm. But we're looking at something that's going to proceed along a much more accelerated timeline. Mm. Bob, do you think that accelerated timeline may be attributable to that upcoming February summit on sexual abuse? The Vatican wants to say, well, look, we, we took care of McCarrick. And is that the proper way to handle something like this? Well, I don't know. I, I mean, we've been all calling for, and our bishops also have been calling for action, that the yep. Holy See not only do something, but, but, but be seen to be doing something. Mm -hmm. So insofar as that's the case, I think that this is, is good. Mm -hmm. But there are, of course, doubts about whether you, you, this, you, you uh, settle the question by expediting it before a meeting so you can be seen to have done something. In my estimation, there probably is enough as evidence against McCarrick of all different sorts that he will eventually be found guilty. Mm -hmm. And it's a good thing, just in general, in general terms, that there'll be this marker sort of laid down there. But I think there are going to be a lot of ongoing questions. And then, of course, there's still the other big questions of how did he manage to survive for so long with all this material in the file at the Congregation for Bishops, and who is responsible for that? Well, and Ed, this begs the larger question. Even if they convict, let's say they convict McCarrick next Wednesday of these crimes, um, which she is alleged to have committed, uh, both against minors as well as seminarians, does this then put to rest the Vigano charges of the way that McCarrick proceeded through the hierarchy, and will that investigation kind of either be forgotten or shelved? I think they're really separate issues, and they need to be treated separately. Mm -hmm. the, the criminal conduct of sexual abuse that Archbishop McCarrick stands accused of is something that needs its own treatment. I think trying to conflate the two with how mm -hmm. Archbishop McCarrick rose to become an archbishop and eventually a cardinal is a separate question that needs to be dealt with at a separate time. I think when you're dealing with a criminal trial, whether it's canonically or civilly, it's important that that be given its own process mm -hmm. and seen in its own terms. If McCarrick is convicted, do you believe that this then puts the pope in a good light, that he's moved expeditiously, he's, he's demanding justice, and he's subjecting this, this archbishop to the full penalties the church allows? 
Well, well I mean, yes, in, in the sense that I just mentioned, that yeah. it, 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 at least steps are now, we can see steps being taken, and we, we know that something has got to happen. It just can't be played out. McCarrick is very old. I mean, we don't know yeah. how much time he has left on this earth, but something has got to happen while he's still alive, because once he dies, it, this is all going to be ancient history, and people aren't going to feel a, a mm -hmm. sense of urgency. I think that, that Ed is exactly right, that they're two separate things, but we shouldn't let th this... A uh, good move, this good public move, mm -hmm. and then also the, the follow-up of the meeting in February. We shouldn't let this deflect us from what needs to be a larger uh, investigation into what's been going on. Mm -hmm. Ed, how does the sentencing work? It's my understanding, uh, Cardinal Mueller sitting where you are, uh, it shocked me when he said only the Pope can allow these penalties to proceed against a bishop. The Pope has that purview and power to himself. I assume the congregation or the CDF could enact those penalties. Apparently they can't. No, absolutely not. And this is entirely correct. I mean, this is a lot of what we've seen um, with some of the frustrations with how the bishops in the United States have been unable to proceed is mm -hmm. bishops aren't accountable to other bishops. Yeah. The church is a hierarchy. It's right. a living hierarchy. And in the end, a bishop answers to the pope. Mm -hmm. Now, only the pope can make a determination about a bishop. Only the pope can open an investigation or a penal process into a bishop. And in the structure of the church, that's as it should be. So also, only a pope can impose penalties on a bishop. Now, in the case of Archbishop McCarrick, what's interesting is this. How will any resolution come out? What charges is he facing? We have a rough idea of the accusations against him, but how they've been formulated, we're not sure. If he's convicted, on what charges will he be convicted? And if he's sentenced and a penalty is imposed, who's imposing it? Mm -hmm. So while only the pope has the authority to lay aside, for example, a bishop, right. he can delegate that power to the CDF. Uh. Now, will the CDF be acting on delegated power to impose a penalty, or will the penalty be imposed in the name of the Pope himself? Mm -hmm. And that can make a big difference. And, Bob, we've seen, in fact, Cardinal Mueller alluded to the fact that there were certain friends of the Pope or in his orbit, or friends of friends in the Pope's orbit, that were spared penalty, or their, or their investigations were mm, muted or brought to a, to a close. Are we concerned that we might see that again? Or is this, because it's so public now, is this forcing almost a, a, a reform within the Curia itself? Well, I think we can hope for that. I, I think that this case is just so flagrant. Explosive. And it, it's, it's clear that this has gone on for a number of years. This isn't just one, one instance where a bishop steps off the curb or he's done a number of things that would cause a pope to remove him from office. This, this goes so deep and it has such long roots that I think we can't help but want to see this investigation go further. I don't know if this is going to lead to, to some questioning of what's going on in Rome, but it certainly ought to, because if I were the Pope, I would like to know around me who might have been involved in what's a very damaging process um, that al allowing a person that was known, I mean, we, we've talked about this yeah. before on the show, was known for many years mm -hmm. to have the beach house and, and there were these rumors about seminarians, to have that for so many years and yet it did not rise to the level of causing any problem of stopping his his advance yes. uh, uh, up yeah. the hierarchy. I think we've got to get to the bottom of that. Mm. Uh, I want to move on to another case uh, beyond McCarrick, because this is an international crisis. Um, we, we see this story in Argentina. I mentioned it a moment ago about this uh, Bishop Zancheta, who a group of seminary, three priests have come forward and said there were a dozen seminarians they're charging that were sexually abused by this bishop. Now, the curious thing here is he resigned from his post. The Pope made him assessor of the Vatican's finances. And now the Vatican has egg on its face and Pope himself because he basically found safe harbor for this man. Now he's not executing his duties while he faces trial. Is this another black mark against the Pope as he tries to face this crisis well, I don't, since he's personally involved? I, he's, his name is personally involved in the sense that it's the Pope who appoints bishops mm -hmm. and it's the Pope who moves them to the Curia. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that we have seen, not just under this Pope, but under previous Popes, no. is they're not necessarily given a full understanding of who they're appointing when someone comes up for a, for a job right. in the Vatican. Right. We've seen other cases where a sanitized version of somebody's resume is put on the Pope's desk and everything looks well. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be irresponsible to conclude that this is something the Pope is personally responsible for 
knowingly involving himself with someone who's got outstanding mm -hmm. accusations. But it does cast a further shadow over the Vatican's handling of senior clergy who seem to have accusations outstanding against them. That is something that does need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. there, there's another case in Argentina of two, two priests at a monastery also charged. Um, uh, the, one of them abusing a former student in the community who was a minor at the time. The abuse started in 2009, continued to 2015. Uh, this is in the Pope's home diocese. Yeah, I would, di I would disagree slightly with you, Ed, in, in this sense, that the Pope knew Zanchetta, Zanchetta, I guess we're yeah. calling it because it's a Spanish pronunciation, yeah. Zanchetta, because he was, um, I think, a, a um, undersecretary for the Bishop's Conference in Argentina. In Argentina. And so when shortly after, I think it was July, he was elected, in, the Pope was elected in March and it was already in July that he appointed this man, it seems that he knew him personally. Now, that said, this doesn't mean that he, he knows everything. He knows everything about, about him. A lot of bishops knew Archbishop McCarrick personally right. and had no idea yeah. what he was up to. Yeah, yeah. But the, the, the fact that during a hiring freeze at the Vatican that the Pope made a special uh, position for this man at the, the the administration of the patrimony of the Holy See. This is not the Vatican Bank. Right. This is the um, the organization that runs the uh, the real estate, the uh, the accounts of religious orders, etc. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty sensitive, powerful position. powerful position. The fact that he put him in there, he must have felt that the man was a good man and that ne he needed some sort of place to land. Mm -hmm. But we have to say, sh should he be consulting maybe with other people when he makes appointments like that? Mm -hmm. uh, I want to move on to the United States bishops ending their retreat this week. The Pope asked them to have a retreat before this February summit to pray together, to discern together what should be done in the midst of this crisis. He sent a letter to them. Much of it is uh, very pastoral. It's really a, an extended reflection. It goes on for eight pages. At the top, he said, I suggested that together you make a retreat, a time of seclusion, prayer, and discernment as a necessary step toward responding in the spirit of the gospel to the crisis of credibility that you are experiencing as a church. When I read that, the you jumped out at me. This is something that we are experiencing as a church. And um, I, I will say a couple of bishops reached out and thought that was a curious omission, uh, the, considering this is a global crisis, as we've been relating. It is a global crisis, but there is a particular crisis of credibility facing the American hierarchy right mm -hmm. now. I mean, this was palpable during the recent Bishops' Conference meeting mm -hmm. in Baltimore, and this is the source of a lot of frustration that they were unable to reach any kind of conclusion at the end of it. So I don't know. I think the Pope was addressing the American church, the American bishops particularly, mm -hmm. and there needs to be a particular address there. Mm -hmm. One thing I really liked about the Pope's letter to the American bishops, mm -hmm. and I liked about the tone of this retreat, yeah. was he emphasized personal conversion in avoiding the temptations of compromise. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that needs needs to be, we need to see more of. A, a controversial opinion I have that not, isn't shared with everyone, but I think that the, the Pope actually has taken the right steps with regards to this pastoral letter and insisting on a week-long retreat for the bishops. A lot of people are looking for the U.S. bishops and for the Vatican to come up with some sort of new structure mm -hmm. and reinvent the procedural wheel to bring bishops to account. Right. I think a lot of what we've seen in the last year, which has seen scandal after scandal in this country and abroad, is a result of human error and human failing. People not doing what they were supposed to do, not following procedures that were already in place. Mm -hmm. And I think until there's a level of personal accountability for that, we're not going to see real change. Bob? Yeah, I think that's true with regard to priests. Um, I'm not so sure about the bishops. I, I still have questions, and of course no one has any simple answer for how we hold bishops accountable. But there seems to be some failure here in the United States. There seems to be similar failures in Argentina, in uh, Guatemala, Chile. in Chile, in Ireland, in uh, Australia. I mean, there, there seems to be a structural problem here. And I want to say again, I don't have any particular uh, insight into how you solve that structural problem, but the mere fact of people being um, encouraged to be more faithful to their vows, to do their, their, their jobs, to be responsible for the people that are under them, all this is very good. But I don't think that it's it's sufficient to dealing with a problem. I think we're going to have to look deeper. In, in I don't know. I'd, I'd take issue with that slightly. Um, the National Review Board in this country issued a letter in August you know, sort of in the middle of everything going wrong, the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report, 
the McCarrick scandal, everything else. And they said that no new processor structure is going to solve what's caused these crises. Mm -hmm. And they said what it is, is it's a crisis. It's a cultural crisis within the American hierarchy. And I think you can apply that slightly more widely. This is a crisis of personal responsibility. And you cannot legislate or reform away personal failings. But, but That's Ed, you it takes brought it up. I, 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 I want to bring this back in perspective because I, I think the audience is thoroughly confused by all of that. They hear canonical reforms and, and expedited trials. It's a blizzard of information to them they can't process. But you hit it on the head very early on when you said, at the end of the day, only the pope can discipline a bishop. Only the pope can allow a penalty to be exacted upon and delivered upon a bishop. That said, why are we having this summit in February? This is a papal, this is a papal prerogative. The Pope and the Curia have it within the reach, and you as a canon lawyer know, the canonical process, I'm not one, but many esteemed ones have told me, the canonical process is here, Raymond. It's all here. Yes. It's, all, it needs to, all you have to do is turn it on. And then the Pope does what he needs to do. So why are we going through this February summit? I think what the... We don't know what they're going to do in the February. Well, summit. we have some indications, which we're going to we talk about. We have some indications, but um, one thing that is clear to me is you're absolutely right in what these other people have said to you about the canonical process is there. I would agree right. with that, and it does need to be turned on. One thing that the canonical process currently lacks is there are gaps carved out in the universal law of the church regarding, for example, clerical discipline, mm. um, ways in which you would articulate more fully sexual misconduct and how to handle it in a diocese. Mm -hmm. Now, those are deliberately carved out in the code of canon law so to make room for particular law in individual dioceses because mm -hmm. problems in one place aren't the same as problems right. in another. Right. And so this was deliberately done. But what we haven't seen a lot of in the last 30 years in the church is bishops taking the initiative and filling in those gaps, which the law expressly encourages them to do. And allows. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm hoping we'll see come out of the February meeting mm -hmm. is bishops coming back, not with some big fix from Rome, but mm -hmm. feeling emboldened and saying, mm -hmm. Rome's on our side. If we want to push the envelope here and start taking firm action, we can do it. Bob, during the holidays, uh, Cardinal Supic came out, who's one of the organizers, the Archbishop of Chicago, uh, of this summit. He says this is expressly to protect minors from sexual abuse. Is that too narrowly casting the problem? And the question. Well, it seems that that's what Rome is, regards the February meeting as. I think a lot of us in the United States had hoped that there would be some sort of practical outcome of what's going to happen. And from everything that I see, um, the people that I trust most who have, seem to have some insight and, and sources mm -hmm. in Rome, what they're trying to do is broaden a general awareness of how to protect young people and other vulnerable people, which is a good thing to do, of course. Here in the United States, I think we can say, in spite of all of our problems, that we're a little bit further advanced on right. that particular problem than many, than probably most other parts mm -hmm. of the world are. We've, ever since 2002 with the Dallas Charter, we've had a pretty, uh, in some cases, I think, overly draconian set of rules about, about priests who have, have, mm -hmm. have committed uh, crimes of one sort or another, or sins of, of one sort or another. I think that the Vatican is looking at this, and, and uh, Andrea Tornielli, who's now the editorial uh, uh, director of the Vatican uh, uh, News Services, talked about the universality of the church and how the church needs to respond right. in a universal way, which, of course, is important. I mean, what we want to talk about is the spiritual mm -hmm. uh, roots that, that inspire all the ways that we behave, including about the, these sorts of problems. But I think that there is a little bit of a disconnect for us in America where we feel that the, uh, the dealing at the, the level of priests is one thing, but we're looking for something else. And perhaps that is right, that we, we come out emboldened and maybe our bishops can come back. I've been saying this all along. I hope that they come back and they feel that now that they can begin to do something that, on a concrete level. And we've had proposals. I mean, even yeah. Stupich has had a proposal. Ed, you just it. wrote a piece about this in the Washington Post. Fine piece. Um, I want to read what Tornielli said and get your reaction okay. to this. He, he said in a statement, which he, the article he posted on the Vatican website, the purpose of the meeting is very specific, to ensure that everyone taking part in it can return to their own country being absolutely clear about what must and must not be done with regard to addressing these cases. Is, is, it, it, does that put a fine enough point on what this summit is about? Not, not yet. Yeah. What are these cases? One of the things, and the McCarrick case highlights this very, very clearly, is you have two distinct levels of crimes that he's accused of. One is the abuse of minors. Now, right. there's, I don't think you can find anyone who's going to say you can act too strongly or too swiftly or too universally against the abuse of minors. Mm -hmm. That's more or less a settled issue. Right. But w you mentioned vulnerable adults, and I think this is going to be an important question, mm -hmm. whether it's addressed or not in February, and how. What is a vulnerable adult? 
right now in the church, in the church's law, a vulnerable adult is someone who habitually lacks the use of reason, essentially someone who has developmental disabilities. Mm. But a lot of people say, th and they're right, that this do wouldn't cover seminarians right. abused by their bishop or by a priest. Right. This doesn't cover someone who's subject to coercive use of authority. Right. The law doesn't cover them yet. Now, people like Cardinal O'Malley in Boston, Marie Collins, of an abuse survivor and yep. a former member of the Pontifical Commission for the Protection mm -hmm. of Minors, has said, broaden this definition out. Make it include these people who have been the victim of abuse of authority as well as sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. So whether or not they're willing to deal with those cases, I think will make a great deal of difference. If yeah. they don't, and this is something I mentioned in my piece yeah. in the Washington Post and also in Catholic News Agency, yeah. is that if they don't address both, then they're going to have a problem. If McCarrick's charges are not answered both, then they're going to have a problem. You need to put this to rest. Otherwise, we're going to look at the church possibly just storing up a next generation of scandals. Yeah. To and do this with touches sentiments. on what Cardinal Brandmuller is now speaking about, which is the, the, that the preponderance of these cases of abuse tend to be homosexual in nature. Now, he says that needs analysis. And, but uh, given the pronouncements coming from the Vatican, it doesn't seem that's on the radar. Well, it's, it, we'll see what come, comes out of this. I mean, this is, these are sort of general statements that are being made primarily to lower, to lower expe expectations, expectations and put walls on this look, thing. It's, yeah. it's three or four days. It's, I think, literally hundreds of people, many of whom may, maybe have never even met one another. Uh, the problem in Africa is different than the problem in Asia, than the problem in Latin America yeah. or North America. So It's starting to feel like a therapeutic uh, session where we are appraised of, or the bishops are appraised, of the feelings and the wounds delivered upon the victims in this abuse. And that is an important, important part of this. But it makes the other point, so what do you do about it? What do you do about it? But I don't think the bishops need to know you can't touch a child, a woman, or a man. You don't do that sexually. You cannot engage with them in those, on, on that level. Why is that such a... Why is that such a mind-blowing concept? Well, uh, I that's... don't know that that's what the bishops need to be told in Rome. What well, I apparently hope... somebody needs to be told because it's happening. Well, yeah. I would... Well. Uh, but again, we're back to this is a crisis of personal accountability, right. not a crisis of structure. And I think... What it is the... where bishops are concerned, though, by your own admission. Well, no, the, again, we're not talking about a crisis of structure even there, because we have instances looking at McCarrick that, as we said, yeah. something was known. People knew. People complained All for right. years about right. him. And somehow, this didn't make its way to the point where the Pope, in this case... Well, even I'd... after settlements, the man was promoted. Exactly. Uh, th this is the problem. But to say that the problem there lies with the Pope, I think, is to miss the point. That's, again, a personal right. accountability failure right. below the Pope, because... Right, it's in the courier. Who is passing these allegations mm -hmm. on? Where are they mm -hmm. going? We know that, for example, Father Boniface Ramsey received a letter right. from the Secretary of State saying that his allegations had been received, mm -hmm. and and they'd had them for years when they wrote to acknowledge what Was them. it 2006? 2006, I think, yeah. they were acknowledged. Mm -hmm. What happened in the interim? Why didn't they go to the Pope? Again, these aren't structural problems. There was a process. No. A letter was sent to the nuncio. The nuncio mm -hmm. forwarded it to the Secretary of State. It went to the Congregation of Bishops. What, why didn't anything happen there? That's a personal problem. That's not a structural problem. Bob? Yeah, but I also think that there are, around the edges, people are trying to look at it, at least adjustments to what the structures are. Even Cardinal Supic, as I was saying earlier, came up with this idea of the metropolitan sort of overseeing local bishops right. at the bishops' meeting after the Holy Father had requested that our bishops in the United States not vote on the two proposals that they had about personal responsibility mm -hmm. and, and, and structural reform. So there's, there's a sense that, um, yeah, if personal responsibility is really the, the key problem, nevertheless, there have to be channels, maybe not restructuring in, in canonical terms, but there have to be channels by which calls for personal responsibility are going to be available that are effective even for bishops. Mm -hmm. Well, in that point, so. Cardinal Subic actually mentioned in Baltimore that he wasn't creating this idea of thin air. Um, in fact, this is something the bishops committed themselves to doing already as part of the Statement of Episcopal Accountability mm -hmm. at the signing of the Dallas Charter. Yeah, back that they were already supposed to be referring accusations they received against themselves to another bishop in the metropolitan mm -hmm. area. This is, again, something that has already been put in place mechanically, yeah. but no one's doing it. No one's it. acting on it. Yeah, so, the, so it, it may as well not be there if they're not acting on it. But so. having a new process isn't going to solve that problem. It won't touch the underlying problem, no. which is that people need to take personal responsibility. If a letter lands on their desk, they need to act on it. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid that's something that hasn't happened, but maybe we will start seeing to happen, because we're mm -hmm. now seeing bishops coming under heavy fire if it comes out that mm -hmm. they were told and they didn't act. Well, well I think that's one ahead. thing that we can hope comes out of Rome in the February meeting. If, if there really is a sense of urgency, this is the way I, I would const mm -hmm. constantly put it, a sense of ur urgency backed by the Holy Father himself, mm -hmm. that people go out and understand that they've got to make it work 
then I think the, the individual national bishops' conferences can go out and, and do what needs to be done in their own territories in the right way for the cultures in which they exist. But that means that Rome really is going to have to um, embolden them, to use that word, mm -hmm. embolden yeah. them to go out and do the right thing. Before I let you all go, uh, on January 1st, the Pope was at the Angelus, and at the end of the Angelus, he did something which he has done in the past. Um, he did not do the traditional blessing. He decided to recite an Old Testament uh, uh, blessing. You, you had a thought or two on this one. Well, Raymond, you remember when we covered the, uh, the conclave. Three days later, he had a meeting for all the journalists. There were 6,000 yeah. of us sitting in the Aula Palo Sesto, and he did the exact same thing, and it really took us all aback. Yeah. Because um, when you're Pope, there's always somebody in the room that isn't necessarily a believer, and yeah. even it may be a room full of cardinals, you don't necessarily have people who are, who are believers. So it's an odd thing that he does. One understands why he does it. He tries to be more universal yeah, he's trying to and, be, yeah. you know, and try to reach inclusive. out on New Year's Day to the, the entire world. But I think if you're the Pope of Rome, you make a, a, a Trinitarian prayer on the feast of uh, Mary, the mother of God. Hmm. Okay. Ed? I don't know. I The Pope sometimes makes these, I don't know if they're spontaneous gestures, but these deviations. And yeah. the bottom line is the purpose of the Pope issuing a blessing to the city and the world is that the world takes notice. We've taken notice. Mm -hmm. We'll leave it there. Bob, Ed, thank you both for your insight. You can find Robert Royal's commentary at thecatholicthing.org and all of Ed Condon's reporting is thecatholicnewsagency.com.